Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and today we're going to be talking about something a tad unique, and that is this particular Xbox 360. Yes, this is a modified Xbox 360, and yes, it can do a whole lot of different things. But I need to get this out of the way right now. This video is going to be long, alright? This is not a video uh, about how to mod your console. This is not a video about how to play the free GTAs! Oh my god, like and subscribe! Like, I, this is not that. Uh, this is not even a video that I can even call a review because this is not a product you can buy or own, uh, at least not through the ways in which I got it. Um, so understand what this is up front, even though I know I'll get a bunch of negative comments about it anyway. Uh, this is a video discussion about my journey with this particular Xbox 360, the story. I'm basically telling you a story. Now, and then at the end, just kind of discussing what a modded Xbox 360 can do, because to me it's new. I've never really had access to one before, and it was just kind of exciting, and I wanted to share that type of story and that sort of uh, journey with you. Um, so again, if you're here to learn how to pirate stuff, wrong video, I'm not teaching you that. Um, and I'm not, I don't even do that. <laughs> so let's, let's just get into the, the, the birth of all of this. Uh, but I warned you, now go grab a drink or some food or something and just sit back and relax. So what we're going to do is talk about this thing. Now, as I mentioned, uh, this is a modified Xbox 360. Now, certainly I do not have the skills to modify an Xbox 360. Now, we're going to go ahead and turn it on. I've, I've got this screen set up here so that you can kind of see how it boots up. Um, now, you'll notice this custom faceplate on it. This is, I mean, from the FAT360, you could get... That was a thing I think Microsoft was trying to make popular was custom faceplates, but they dropped that pretty quick when it came to the, the, the later models. Um, this is an old Transformers one from 2007. And then this LED you're seeing on here is not even part of the modification. It's literally just like, oh, wouldn't that be cool? I, I bought this device that you see that's uh, lit up Again, back in like 2007, its purpose was to have a link between the hard drive and the console. And on the back, there's a USB port that allows you to connect it to a computer. And the idea, like, you know, 13 years ago, was that you could copy over saves back and forth. And yeah, it's it's completely useless now. It does not work. I'm pretty sure it was firmware patched out of functionality. So why do I have it there? I don't know, pretty blue light. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, so it's booting up. Now you'll notice it took a long time because it has to scan three different hard drives and we'll get back to that in a second. And then you see this custom dashboard uh, that's called Aurora. And from there, that'll have a series of homebrew apps. And we will get back to talking about it, but I figured it's better just to have this in the background while we discuss. So this particular console, wh why do I have this? What's going on? It's actually kind of funny. So back in 2017, summer of 2017 is where our story sort of starts. Technically, it starts in 2014, but whatever, summer of 2017. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I went to Europe, specifically, I think I was in Austria, and I bought a game called Iron Sky Invasion for the Xbox 360. It was a European exclusive game, so I would never have had the option to get it here. For those who watch the channel frequently, you'll know that I like to collect video games. It's fun for me. Um, and I do like my imports. Although, with the case of the 360, it was... Honestly, it was not a region-free console. There's a lot of games that were, and there's a lot that weren't. And why that was, I'm not entirely certain. I, I know it was developer optional. And for some reason, a lot of developers opted to use region coding. Whereas on the PlayStation 3, it was also optional. And with only one exception, nobody ever used it. That exception being Persona 4. Um, but everybody else just made the console region free. So I bought the game not knowing whether or not it would work. So I got back here and I tried it out and it didn't boot up. It was region coded. And I was like, well, that sucks, but whatever. It's Iron Sky Invasion. It's the video game adaptation of a TV show that I don't even have access to watching. So who really cares? It didn't matter to me. It was like, whatever, it's not a big deal. It just kind of sucked that I didn't technically have the option to play it. So uh, I mentioned that in a video at some point, and my buddy Fox, who lives out in South Korea, I've mentioned it many times, um, he saw the video and he was like, hey man, I have this old modded Xbox 360. If you want it, you can have it. I'm pretty sure it's region free uh, and you should be able to play that game on there. And I was like, dude, it's, it's Iron Sky Invasion. I don't really care all that much. And he's like, it's like, dude, it's taking up space in my house. I don't even care. Like, you know, if you want it, you can have it and you can play that game. It might even make an interesting video someday. And I was like, mm, okay. So he sends it my way. It arrives and I try to use it. It does not work. It barely booted up. It, it had a jet engine like fan. Uh, and it's, I think it was just like barely, barely about to reach the RROD 
stage. Like, it was on its last legs. It just, it didn't work. It couldn't read discs either. So it was like, that sucks, but what are you going to do? And I, I told that uh, a longer version of that story in a video towards the end of 2017. I think it was like December 2017. So fast forward just a month later, I get a message from one of the most prolific modders on YouTube, a guy named Mr. Mario, who I'm sure a lot of you guys know. He messages me in January of 2017, and he's like, hey man, I saw that video, uh, if you want, I can make you like a modded Xbox 360. And here's the thing, uh, multiple things actually. First, check out Mr. Mario, he was cool enough to make this console happen. He was also, he had, we have a, he have, I have a brother video, if you will, over there of him modding this exact console on his channel. So you can see the whole process. If that's why you're here, you're like, how do I mod it? He made a video specifically about that. Go check it out. He's a much better YouTuber than me. So he's got that going on. Um, but, you know, he also, um, when, when we were talking about it, he was just like, hey man, you know, I'd love to hook you up with this modded Xbox 360. And I, I told him, look man, I don't know anything about the modded Xbox 360 scene. And there's a little side story here, as my videos always have side stories. But the original Xbox, I knew the modding scene for that pretty well. I mean, that thing was a modder's paradise. As I'm, I'll, Even people with an elementary knowledge of the retro gaming scene usually know that the original Xbox was a modder's dream because it was all PC counterpart parts. And people were modding that thing while it was relevant. And you could do all sorts of crazy stuff to it. And the most thought I had ever put into a modded Xbox 360 was, hey, wouldn't it be cool... Back in like, when it was like 2004 when I had my first modded Xbox. When the Xbox 360 came out only a year later in 2005, I thought, wow, man, I'll bet you one day uh, there's going to be modded Xbox 360s and they're going to be like the original Xbox, but even crazier. So it's going to have emulation for PlayStation 2 and Dreamcast and GameCube. Isn't that going to be crazy? None of that ever happened. <laughs> the Xbox 360 modding scene never got that far because Microsoft learned a lot about... There's actually a famous story about how um, in Redmond, Washington, uh, some employees had a modded Xbox. They wheeled it into Bill Gates' office and showed it to him and was just like, what do we do? Like, we're thinking legal action. We got to do this and that. And he was just like, no, man, that's actually genius. Like, the, the fact that they came up with all these great ideas, we should be using some of these ideas. And my understanding of that situation is that they did. They, they actually cloned a lot of those concepts. I don't know which one specifically. If I had to guess, I'd say things like having a bigger hard drive in there, an option to change out the hard drive, um, things like the, the entire Xbox Live Arcade concept probably came from that to an extent. Uh, I would also bet that, you know, the Xbox 360, you can install your games from the disc onto the console. You still need the disc in order to play it, but, you know, you can then get the benefits of having the load times from a hard drive as opposed to just using the disc directly. I'm betting a lot of that came from that particular story, but I don't know for sure. Um, but anyway, so I knew a lot about that era, and I always thought, wouldn't it be cool if they, you know, did it with this? But no, Microsoft also learned what not to do from that situation, so they made their consoles a lot more custom and harder to uh, crack and a lot harder to work with um, for, for the piracy scene, if you want to call it that. That's not fair. The homebrew scene would be a better term, because again, don't, don't do the piracy route, especially with Xbox stuff. That stuff's all cheap. You don't need to do any of that. Um, we'll get back to that later. But anyway, so uh, I was always kind of curious what that would amount to, but it never really came into anything. So now fast forward all the way back again now to January 2018 when I'm talking to Mr. Mario about it and I'm asking that question finally like what does it do? What how far did it get? Uh, and he basically tells me like it never got nearly as far but you know here's what yours will do. Uh, it will be modded. It, I, I he said he was going to do what's called the reset glitch hack, which I don't even pretend to know exactly what that is. Um, it's I know it involves soldering. I know it involves stuff. Again, go watch his video. He's a much better YouTuber than me. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's like, I'll do that, and I'm going to do some other things and this and that and whatever. Um, but by the end, you'll have this custom dashboard that will allow you to read games off of hard drives. Um, and the disk drive itself will not be region free, but the system will be so that if you have a game off of a hard drive, you can then read uh, off there and play the import. And this is key because this is part of why I think he was interested in sending this to me back then, which is, um, if it isn't obvious from my videos, I'm a bit of a pack rat. Like I kind of keep everything. Um, and one of the things I actually keep and archive is uh, disc-based content. And I don't mean just on the shelf. I mean like I digitally back it up and preserve it in hard drives. 
You might ask why, and to almost everyone on the planet, that would be a fair question, so I, I don't blame you. Um, but basically, here's the thing. I obviously get a lot of used games, uh, disc-based content, and the thing is with, like, cartridges, you don't really have to worry. If it boots, it's pretty much good to go. There's almost nothing that's ever really going to go wrong with it. But discs, it's not the same case. You need to rip a disc to a computer to verify. Why did I pronounce it like it was the 1980s? Computer. Uh, you have to rip a disc to a computer to verify every single sector of data on the disc. Otherwise, potentially, there can be issues, and I'm sure I'm going to hear it. It's like, no, dummy, I put the game in the console and it played, so it totally works. You're an idiot. You're wasting your time. Fair-ish? Thanks for that. But that's not really true. The, the boot sectors of a game can still function while later sections of the game disc do not. So, meaning you could be like, hey, I got to the start menu, I can even start playing, and eventually on, like, level three, the whole game might crash. You don't really know until you actually verify the disc, especially in the era of disc rot and all that stuff. I just felt that... It was important to back up every single disc that I owned. And with every console, with the exception of the Xbox One, though with the Xbox One you don't need to because it does it to its own external storage device. With that exception, I can rip every single disc for every single disc-based console. Um, some are more complicated than others. And I, I set up this project in 2014 just for my own purposes, not realizing that one day things like ODEs would become so significant. Things like the RIA, the GDMU, or even this, which is not an ODE, of course. Um, but, you know, all those projects where, you know, it's like, hey, I have a console, I slightly modified. I put this SD card reader and you need the ISO. Uh, well, I ripped my whole collection already. So again, I'm not interested in piracy. I just want to use games I actually own. Um, so I, I was kind of ahead of the curve on that unintentionally. I'm not going to say it was some brilliant move because it really wasn't. It was just me being a digital pack rat. But anyway, so he knew I was doing that with the Xbox 360 because I had mentioned it in a video at some point. So he's like, I know you must have a copy of that Iron Sky Invasion game digitally backed up. Um, and so if you want, what you can do is you can take that file and you can basically put it onto a hard drive and then you can play it from there. And so I learned from that process that, um, you can't just take the ISO. This is going to, this is very rudimentary, but basically, um, people mix up certain terms here. ISO is basically a complete digital replica of a disc. Um, to the exact file size, and it's, it's like a mirror image of a disc. It's a clone of it. There's ROM, which applies to cartridges, which is the same idea. It's a complete digital clone of a game cartridge. And then there's RAW files, which is once you get past those initial states, it's like here's every single folder and every single file on there. That's the RAW files. Now, an ISO is actually useless in this context, um, at least in that form, because the Xbox 360 will not recognize an ISO, at least not that I'm aware of. You would have to actually burn it onto a disc to make it work, which I had no interest in doing. Why would I care about that? The whole point is to not use the discs. Um, so I didn't have any interest in that. Um, but what I wanted was the RAW files. Now, there are programs out there that do that. So you basically take the Xbox 360 ISO and you turn it into RAW files. Now the thing is, and I don't know if people care about this or not, but it's just kind of interesting. One of the protection, I think it was a protection method, I'm just guessing, with the Xbox 360 was that it had to have a very specific file size per disc. I think it was seven and a half gigs, um, whereas there are other consoles that did that. The Dreamcast used 1.1 gigabyte discs. Uh, the GameCube, I think it was like 1.35 or 1.36, something like that. But every single game was exactly that file size. And it's like, well, that's suspiciously weird. How could every game end up being exactly the same size? The answer is they can't. So not every game needs all that space. So what would happen is they were like, okay, our game is only like, hey, let's say five gigs. What do we do? How do we fill the rest of that gap? And they put in what's called a dummy file, which you can kind of think of it like packing material in a package. If you order something from a company or whatever, you get your package and the thing you want is in there. There's also a bunch of packing material in the box itself. That's all crap you don't need. You can toss that to the side. That's a dummy file. That's what that is. Not a perfect analogy, but I think you get it. Um, so once you take the ISO and then convert it into RAW files, often the game will shrink substantially, which is good for storage purposes, um, but also good because that's actually how you have to execute the games. Um, so yeah, I learned a lot doing all this stuff. Um, but yeah, so he's like, go ahead, you can try that out. And um, I was like, okay, cool, that's, that's what I'll do. That was back in February of 2018. And if you want to see this process, you can actually see in February, there's an episode of Playload in February 2018 in which I opened up this exact Xbox 360. Now here's where I apologized to Mr. Mario a thousand times over. And I will apologize because I know it makes me a jerk, and I get it, and I'm sorry. But he sent it to me in 
you guys, it, it, right now we're living in lockdown time, so everybody's at home. There's time to tinker with stuff like this. The truth is, in February 2018, I was a very busy guy. And for all of 2018, all of 2019, I was extraordinarily busy. And when I say that, I mean I was never home. In 2019, for example, I spent two months out of the entire year collectively at home. I live in Chicago, but I was almost never here. Over that time span, I was in 11 different countries in 46 different cities in just that year. And it's always like conventions and events and things I was being sent to. So I was, con you know how many times I went to San Francisco? It was ridiculous. It's like I went to San Francisco more than I was at home. It was insane. And the same basically applied to 2018. The point I'm trying to make here is there was no time for me to really tinker with the Xbox 360 he sent me. I essentially got it, I put it off to the side and more or less it was like, okay, I'll deal with you when I have time. Just to give you a true sense of exactly that time frame, again, the end of February of 2018, and then the, like the beginning of, or mid-March, or no, sorry, mid-April of that exact same year, I went to Japan three different times. So the point is, I was never home. I never had time to play with it. And so I felt like a jerk because it wasn't until lockdown where I actually had a chance to fire it up and use it. I know that makes me bad. Something, somebody sends me this like really cool thing. I get it. I suck for not having time to tinker with it, but it's just, I didn't. It's just the truth. And once I've actually, now that I've actually used it a lot, whew, there's no way I would have been able to do it in the last couple of years because it took weeks to get this thing where I wanted it. But that's a different story for later. Uh, potentially, unless I forget. But anyway, so uh, two years go by, lockdown comes down, and I, I find this thing, and I'm like, oh, dude, I should fire this thing up and like start tinkering with it. This is a cool project for me to work on, right? And I fire up the console, and that happens. You know, the 360 screen shows up, and then we get to the Aurora dashboard, and you see the apps like this, and I'm like, awesome. And I, I grow, go and I grab Iron Sky Invasion. I put it in there, and I'm like, all right, sweet, we're gonna play this game for the first time ever. And it didn't work. It recognized it as a DVD, and I was like, right, region coding, right, right, right. He did say that, he did say that. So let me go grab a North American game. I put in Call of Duty 2. Same thing, it just recognized it as a DVD. And I wanna be very specific. Xbox Original and Xbox 360 both have DVD structure video files on them. That, so like, for example, if you take one of those games and pop it into a PlayStation 2, it will actually boot that disc, but it will boot it as a movie because there's a file on there that just plays back as a, a video and basically just says, hey, this is an Xbox disc or this is an Xbox 360 disc, go put it into the console if you wanna play it. Um, and it was recognizing every single game as that. And I'm like, well, that's really strange. So then I decided, okay, let me try the hard drive method. So I, I took the ISO, I converted it to raw file, stuck it onto a hard drive, plopped it in, and I went ahead to boot it. Now the console recognized the hard drive and it recognized the file structure and it went ahead and played it. I'm like, that's really weird. Why is it not recognizing disks? So then I had to take the very awkward step of contacting Mr. Mario and being like, yeah, I suck. Here's what happened. And he just thought that was hilarious. And we talked back and forth and he's like, I don't know what really could have happened to it. I mean, it's possible just sitting there for two years, it just died. I don't know without looking at it. And I was like, are you willing to look at it? And he's like, yeah, if you want to send it back to me, I'm happy to do that. So to his credit, he did. I sent it to him and he was fast, man. Like I sent it to him on like on Monday, like by Friday, I already had it back, like fully repaired. But basically he sends it back to me and uh, he, he said, here's what he did. He's like, I updated the reset glitch hack. I redid the entire installation. I did all this stuff. Uh, I put new thermal paste in there. Um, he also mentioned that the DVD drive was actually, the issue with it, uh, I don't want to blame him because nobody's there's no one to blame, but it was technically his fault. Um, the drive and the console each have a, a key and they have to match. And he didn't make the match before he first sent it out like two years ago. It was just a simple oversight, but hey, I didn't notice for two years, so it's like, whatever, nobody's really, everybody's at fault in that scenario. <laughs> but anyway, so he fixed that. Um, he also updated certain things, like a bunch of the apps he updated. He also updated the original Xbox backwards compatibility. This is a side story, but this I think is fascinating. So the, orig the Xbox 360 uh, is not natively compatible with the original Xbox. But Microsoft wanted to have Xbox original backwards compatibi compatibility in it when they launched it. So they basically just built an emulator for it. Um, now that project was functional for two years. From 2005 to 2007, I think it was November 2007, they started pulling it. Um, but basically they were constantly going in and updating it and saying, oh, we refined the emulator some more and now it plays this game and it plays this game. And they would whitelist certain games they had decided were compatible or worked well enough that they could certify them. By the end, about 500 games were made compatible out of a thousand game library, which is, to be honest, actually a pretty impressive number. 
Um, but that's as far as it ever got. Randomly, in 2018, 11 years later, they updated it one more time. And as I understand it, what happened was um, they had no interest in updating the Xbox 360's emulator for the original Xbox anymore, but they ran into a small problem that was technically at the fault of Sega. Or not really the fault, but I guess you can credit them with it. Um, the When Microsoft was creating the original Xbox backwards compatibility program for the Xbox One, one of the games that was added to it was Panzer Dragoon Orta. Now, Microsoft likes things to be cross-compatible. It's a big part of their whole sales pitch, right? So if you bought a, a digital copy of Panzer Dragoon Orta on Xbox One, you are technically entitled to use that on an Xbox 360, provided that you have um, the same user accounts and all that stuff. The problem was, in PAL territories, the PAL version of Panzer Dragon Orta was not really compatible with the Xbox 360. They never got that far, even though the North American version worked. So they had to update it one more time specifically for one version of one game so that cross-compatibility would function. But what that meant was, in that process, they had also technically updated the emulator one more time, so it did see additional benefits. Again, focused on one game, but that doesn't mean the benefit couldn't theoretically apply to other games, either already uh, compatible or even games incompatible. So he took that uh, latest version of the, the, the emulator, he threw it on there, and he also whitelisted the whole thing. Now, the way it worked back in the day and still does work on stock units is that when you put in an original Xbox game, it basically checks what game it is, and then it checks the emulator and says, like, right, is this game on the compatibility list or not? If it is on the compatibility list, it's certified and it just says, okay, go ahead and play. If it's not on the list, it's like, I know that's an original Xbox game, but I'm not authorized to actually play it, so this is as far as we're going. This version doesn't have any said restriction. It just tries to play anything it sees as original Xbox data, which has mixed results. Anything that was ever really made compatible works fine. Um, but then obviously there's games that will just instantly crash. There's games that will crash part of the way in. There's games that will like fail to load textures. There's, and then there's games that work flawlessly that for some reason were just never authorized to go. Um, but there's also ones that have really unique errors. And like the saddest one, and yet also the oddest, was um, my one of my favorite games on the original Xbox, of the entire sixth generation actually, is a game called Second Sight. I recommend this game all the time. It's on GameCube, PS2, and original Xbox. I highly recommend it. I was really hoping that that game would become compatible. It never was, but I was like, oh, now I got another chance. I can try and play it on here. And it booted up. And I was like, oh man. And then the cutscenes were flawless. The audio was flawless. Everything looked great. It was working perfectly. I was like, this is so cool. I'm going to get to play it on like, you know, I granted emulation, but in higher resolution, blah, blah, blah. I'm so excited. And the game boots up. No graphical texture errors. Nothing's wrong. And I'm like, yes, I grabbed the controller. And it doesn't recognize the left thumbstick. It recognized every other button, but not the left thumbstick. So I couldn't make the character move or do anything other than what the other buttons would allow the character to do, making the game, of course, unplayable. And I was like, that's... Ugh, that sucks! <laughs> but then what was even weirder is that game was made by Free Radical. They're the guys who made Time Splitters. I actually checked the other Time Splitter games that were not ever made compatible, and they all did exactly the same thing. They booted perfectly, everything about them flawless, never recognized the left thumbstick. I'm like... That's an oddly unique error that clearly had something to do with the engine or whatever that Codemasters used. I don't know what it was, but wow, that's strange. But that, that's as unique as it gets as far as the original Xbox. So anyway, um, yeah, so I've got every original Xbox game that I own on this hard drive, uh, as well as, um, and they're organized based on what was originally compatible and uh, what is not originally compatible. Like, I, I did all sorts of organization. And this hard drive uses uh, Xbox 360 games that I ripped myself. Now, uh, talk, going back to the hard drives thing. So, yes, there is two hard drives I have externally. Now, the thing with the Xbox 360 is it's only capable of uh, storing two terabytes of storage per uh, input, meaning... Uh, this hard drive could only be two terabytes. This hard drive can only be two terabytes. This one can only be two terabytes. If you put anything bigger, it simply will either not recognize it or depending on how you formatted it, it'll recognize it up to two terabytes. It's just a limitation of the software, I guess. Um, I know there's, there's something about two terabytes is always a very specific limitation. Kind of like how FAT32 can only have four gigabyte files. Like it's just a thing. Um, 
Now, the Xbox 360 is also only capable of housing three storage devices at once, not including like the memory cards or the disk drive. Meaning, at any given time, the absolute maximum of storage you could have on an Xbox 360 that's modified, or stock actually, is six terabytes collectively. Now, unless you're trying to like get an entire collection, you're really never gonna need six terabytes, um, and that's not what I did. Um, now, in my case, I decided one two terabyte drive was more than enough for the original Xbox, and one two terabyte drive was more than enough for the Xbox 360, again, with the games I own. Um, but, when he first sent this to me, he sent it to me with a 20 gigabyte hard drive, which was enough to house like, you know, this, like the dashboard and all that stuff and the basic apps. But I'm like, I really think it would be better to have a bigger hard drive in there so that I could have more options on what I want to do. Um, and also potentially could at some point free up a USB slot because this particular console is the Jasper version, which uh, as I understand it is the most reliable and runs cooler and is a better version, but it also is limited to simply three USB ports. Unlike this one, which actually has five on it, plus the Kinect port. This, not that I care about the Kinect, but I couldn't even play the Kinect on this version if I wanted to without removing hard drives. Um, but again, who cares? But um, yeah, so uh, with all that, I was like, I should put a bigger hard drive in it. and. I did something that he thought was really strange and he didn't understand it until afterwards when I explained my motivation, which was I gave him a one terabyte hard drive, but I gave him a one terabyte SSD. Now he thought that was ridiculous overkill because most people naturally will assume the reason you're putting an SSD into something is for the speed benefits. Solid state drives run much faster than mechanical drives, they just do. The problem with the Xbox 360 is it's from 2005. It uses SATA 1. The benefits of an SSD are non-existent. <laughs> on an Xbox 360, it's this, it, it's not gonna go any faster than a mechanical drive. But that's not why I cared. I cared because the Xbox 360 is one of history's, if not history's most infamously poorly designed consoles. It breaks with a feather. The infamous RROD. I don't want that. <laughs> like, now granted, there's not much I can do to prevent that, but one thing I could do to contribute to possibly having this thing live longer is using a solid state uh, drive that is less likely to break down because it's less moving parts than a mechanical drive. That was it. That's why I cared about it. So once he understood that, he's like, oh, that does actually make sense. Although he claims he's really never had hard drive failure. But I've had a lot of hard drive failure in my time, so I did not want that. If I could reduce those odds, I was going to take it. But that said, the two drives I have externally are both mechanical drives, but I'm less concerned about those because you could swap those out if you really need to. Um, now, uh, it should be noted that the hard drives also have to be formatted for FAT32, as I briefly mentioned there. FAT32 is strange format. It's obviously a much older format. Um, but when you want to use something like an external drive with it, um, it's, I believe the, the stock version of the 360 will actually, um, will actually uh, update and format a drive for you. But once you do that, the drive is useless on a computer. Now in that situation, until you reformat it again. But we don't want to do that. Uh, in this case, we wanted to have a drive that functions on both the computer and on the Xbox so that you can easily migrate data between the two. Because um, you need to do that in order to convert your ISOs and whatever, it's a long process. But so Windows will not natively format a drive that big to FAT32, it just won't. So you have to find external software and there are tons of it, it's freeware out there. It's all legit, it's just a thing, you just need different software. And once you format it, then everybody's happy, it all works. Um, so yeah, ultimately, that's what we have. We have a modded Xbox 360 at this point in time with five terabytes of storage collectively, which is insane and overkill, it doesn't really need it, but it's there for future proofing. And this is actually how I'm going to now play the Xbox 360 because, uh, you know, I have my discs and will always have my discs, but if I don't have to disturb them, that's just, that's great. And I also get all the load benefits out of it, but again, no interest in piracy. I couldn't care less. Like, the thing is, and I was briefly touched on this before, the original Xbox and the Xbox 360 are, for the most part, their games are just completely worthless. They're not valuable. And I've been collecting them for years, so it's like, it's just not worth it to me to, like, have to deal with that. There's nothing so badly on that console that I want to play that I can't pick up for basically nothing. It's just not how it is. There's a couple of Japanese games that proved to be an exception to that, but I'm still not interested in pirating them because I just like don't really care. You know what I mean? This is not important. Like, why risk it? So, to me, I treat this kind of the way I would the Dreamcast GDMU. I have a full Dreamcast collection, and now I have the option of getting all the speed benefits and all, all that out of using the SD cards. Same idea. Granted, it's not an ODE. There's, there's no optical disc emulation in this thing. It's just doing it a different way. But you get all the benefits that come with that. So, that's awesome. Now, uh... 
basically there's 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 so much content on this thing. That's what took me the most time. Once I figured out what this process was and how you had to migrate data, unpack data, convert data, like, dude, you have no idea like how awful and tedious that is. It took me forever. And again, that's with the advantage of having ripped most of my games six years ago. I still have, let me walk you through the basic process. Let's say you're starting from scratch. You have to rip a disc uh, to the computer. I mean, you could do it with the 360 itself, but I didn't do that because I had ripped them years ago. So I had ripped every disc and then I had compressed it with WinRare and just archived it. So I had to uncompress every single disc, one at a time. And then you have to use a program that takes the ISO and converts it to raw files. Then you have to take the raw files and move it from one hard drive over to another drive, which depending on the caliber of your drives and you know the, the computer and all that can be relatively expedient, that particular part if you're using 3.0 and all that. But the Xbox 360 itself does not. It uses 2.0. So if you're using some sort of drive to migrate data between the, basically like if I want to put stuff on the internal drive from the computer, you have to have a drive in between. So like I would take one hard drive that was like USB 2.0, like an old fat drive I had laying around, like a 250 gig drive, and I would dump games onto that. And then you'd stick it in here and then use it to transfer games to the internal drive excessive but it's it, it takes a really long time um and for every single xbox 360 game you had to do that same with the original xbox you have to take them you have to uncompress them in my case you have to turn them from isos to raw files and so on and so forth it took forever and then once you actually have all that in the case of the original xbox i had to sit there and test every single game that was not microsoft certified to see how well it worked the other thing is with xbox 360 games of course a lot of them had patches now this software actually has uh, the option to download patches. It's not for every game, but there are a bunch. So I went through and I manually downloaded every single patch that exists. And so you start bug testing that. There's also, there's, there's processes, like there's a whole bunch of games that um, you can have on your Xbox 360 uh, stock unit, or there's DLC, like you could have arcade games, you could have games with gold games, you could have um, game saves. Uh, you could have uh, DLC, as I said before. You could have a bunch of stuff on there, and there are ways, I'm not going to go into this because it's just not the point of the video, but there are ways to take that data and put it on here. Um, and that comes with its own time constraints and its own you know, issues. Uh, and yeah, I had to do all that. It's just like, ugh. <laughs> like, the way I see it is, if I had bought DLC for any reason, that's mine, and I shouldn't be allowed, I shouldn't be... Uh, forced to not have access to it and there are ways to deal with all that but every single one of these processes takes an eternity but the end result this is the end result where it's all cleaned up it's all good to go and you have this nice clean dashboard that can do all sorts of things now you still have access to the original xbox profile guide um, which is actually interesting this is the other i meant to get back around to this when i was talking about the um original xbox emulation one thing that mr mario also mentioned is that they uh the hacked version of it if you guys remember the original xbox had this cool feature where you could rip music cds to the console and then once the music cds were there there were certain games that were compatible with that so like for example gta 3 uh when you're in the cars driving around you know you'd have the radio station one of the radio stations was actually the music files you had saved to your console when they did the uh, emulated version it didn't support that feature anymore um, there were back doors to it, but that doesn't really matter. But this, uh, he said, that's now restored. So any game that was actually compatible with it, you can, I haven't tinkered with that, but it's really cool to know that that's there. Um, but yeah, so yeah, you would have options like that. But here's a bunch of the just random software that's on there that have, every one of these has like some sort of different feature and I haven't played with all of them. But you also have options down here to uh, change from the homebrew games that show up, all your games, uh, Xbox 360 games, Xbox Live Arcade games, Kinect games, we're never gonna make use of that. But um, yeah, I, let me, um, yeah, if you show, well actually I'm not gonna do show all because that'll take forever because it's got all the uh, OG Xbox stuff on there. So we'll switch over to just um, Xbox 360 stuff and there's a ton of it because I own a lot of games. And where are you? I'm gonna run Call of Duty 2, one of my all time favorites there. Um, now, this game was already pre-patched. I went ahead and downloaded that. But once you actually get past all this stuff, you'll see that it, you know, it, it runs the same. It runs smooth. It runs clean. It runs faster. Now, um, yeah, this was actually... I always loved this game. But uh, then you can see the different hard drive options you can switch around in. Mission Select. I've already played this game. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it runs great. 
It runs great. Mr. Mario did a fantastic job. And this is like, this is, it, it, like, I would never do all this work again unless it was for myself because it would just take an eternity. Plus, you know, I don't own the right to sell these things anyway, so it makes no difference. But, man, like, the amount of time that it took him to do that work plus me to do this other side of work, I, I can't even... I, I genuinely kind of pity anybody who wants to, you know, try this. But if you do, uh, first go to Mr. Mario and watch his videos and learn how to do it because he's not going to sell you one. I want to make that very clear. You can't buy this. I was kind of trying to make that reference at the beginning. Mr. Mario will not sell you one of these. He does not sell modded consoles. He just kind of does them for his own purposes. And then he occasionally hooks people up that with it for whatever reason. I honestly do not really know why he chose me back two years ago to hook up with one of these. And other than, you know, what he said, which was just like, hey, so you can play an import game. But you can't, like, don't go bother him and say, like, hey, man, you know, can you mod me a console? I want to play the GTAs. Like, just don't. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work that way. Um, and then after that, like, once you have the modded console, there's a ton of data work. So, yeah, dude, if I had, if I had actually committed to doing this in 2018 or 2019 i logistically speaking there would never have been time to do all the work that it took and i know it doesn't look like a lot of work it's like dude it was all pretty smooth it's like yeah because you have no idea like all this the little stuff you have to do to make all that work and all the time that went into it you know it's the, the one of the silver linings of all this lockdown stuff is time to play with this sort of thing but um yeah, if uh, so, I, I, ho I hope this was kind of interesting to people just to kind of see what the journey of the Xbox 360 modding scene has kind of become. Um, you know, I like the, the, this is the updated version of the dashboard there. It shows like things like the temperature of the console and it still has a bunch of features and you can still get access to like um, your system settings because I couldn't figure that out first. You know, like there's a lot of those original dashboard features are still there. Um, as you can see, like that version's there. Now you're probably wondering, like, Xbox Live, like, can it do that? No. Uh, but you can still connect to the internet. In fact, it is connected. And what it'll do is it connects to like private servers that host like those title updates and all that sort of stuff. So it's, um, all I can say is that Mr. Mario did an absolutely phenomenal job. Um, and I highly advise you go to his channel and watch his videos if you have any interest on this because the man has infinite knowledge and can teach you so much about how to do that because he has a super passion about the Xbox 360. Um, and all I can really do is give you some guidance on like, hey man, like, you know, here's, here's how you do some of the conversion stuff. Cause he's just way on another level. Like he's like, you know, Superman. I'm like a little chimp walking next to him. Like it's just it's so much different, but, um, yeah, so it's, I can't thank him enough for this. Cause once you have it up and running, man, this is just a really, really cool project. And you know, I, I still like tinkering with it and looking at different things. And like this is, it's got file transfer system stuff in it. So you can do FTP protocols to network stuff over. Although I didn't do that because when you can use actual hard drives, that's just going to be a lot more expedient. Um, but you know, it's got all these utilities. You can rip disks directly to the console if you want to do that, which in the future is probably how I would do it because it's more efficient than the method I was doing previously when I get any new games, I suppose. But it can extract both original Xbox and Xbox 360 data. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's just, it's got all sorts of crazy stuff on it and um i have I, to be honest with you despite all the work i've done on this thing i've kind of only barely scratched the surface of it there's a lot of again i'm not going to go into the details of this but if you have any of the stuff like with games with gold or any of the arcade games those are tedious to get to work on this um it's doable but it's it's a pain it's a pain the only stuff i ran into that was actually problematic um, after, you know, because everything, everything was a bit of a problem until you kind of figured out. DLC, it's like, why doesn't that work? Okay, now I figure out how to make it work. Arcade games, why doesn't that work? Okay, now I figure out how to make that work. Saves, all that stuff. But the one that really confused me the most was there are a bunch of original, or sorry, Xbox 360 compilation discs that consist of arcade games. So like Xbox Live Arcade Unplugged, for example, had like something, I don't remember exactly, let's say five games on it. And it was all the arcade games, like Pac-Man and this and that, whatever. And... If you stick that into a stock console, it will basically launch an executable that creates a menu. The menu just has the five games or whatever in it, and you can click on any one of them. So it just works. But the modded 360 doesn't recognize it the same way. Um, it gets a little confused because it just thinks of it as a, a folder structure. And the thing with Xbox Live Arcade games is, unless they are tied to a specific account, they are considered locked data. 
So it's really messed up. With those particular releases, you essentially have to rip them to the console and then unlock them in the same way you would if you were pirating them, which I really don't like that because, again, I own the disc. I own the damn game. Like, but, but that was one of the most confusing ones to try and figure out. But yeah, it's um, it's a lot of tinkering, man. But there's just there's so many cool features in this thing, and yeah, see, it's got all this stuff: the two hard drives, system data, more system data, the digital version of a memory card, um, some hard drive data, the primary hard drive, flash drive. Like, there's just there's just so much stuff in there. And then every like, I personally created a ton of folders for all the games to make sure they were all properly organized and. I'm also, like I said, I'm a bit of a digital pack rat, but I'm also a very organized digital pack rat. I like things to be exactly where they need to be and all that. So one of the settings here is, you know, like I was showing you there, you can change it. So I have it set so it just boots to the homebrew stuff because that otherwise it gets ridiculous. Like it could literally be as many games as you've got long, which potentially, I mean, if you have the original Xbox, like its entire collection, that's a thousand games. So imagine trying to find a specific title when you have to wheel through a thousand games plus Xbox 360 content. Like I didn't want to do that. So I haven't, that's the only part of it I haven't really narrowed down is how to clean that up a little bit. Um, but you know, first world problems, I suppose. That's why I don't keep it on show all, but you can change it. You can do it specifically for Xbox 360 content, specifically for Xbox Live Arcade content, specifically Connect, as I mentioned before. The only one that's missing, for whatever reason, is it doesn't have an option for just original Xbox content. I don't know. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, I guess that'll about do it. Um, if you, I'm sure there's gonna be people with some questions and I'll attempt to answer some, but again, I'm, I'm the chimp compared to the Superman that is Mr. Mario, but don't bother him with like, hey man, I really want the console. Like, you're not gonna get it, this is not gonna happen. It's, if you want it, go find the parts, watch his video and follow the process and learn how to do it. And I, it's, that's the only advice I can really give you because he's, he's not gonna mod it for you. So. I hope this was informative for anybody out there who was somewhat interested in what eventually happened with the Xbox 360 scene that didn't already know about it. And like, you know, maybe it's just some people will be like, oh dude, that's really cool. I'd love to have one. Like, who knows? Or maybe you just found the stories fascinating. I don't know. But uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, thank you very much for watching everybody. Thank you, huge thank you to Mr. Mario for everything he did with this. Because he also put up with me, which was not an easy task. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, thank you guys very much. If you could please like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much and I'll see you all later.